Hello. It looks like there are a few of you watching, and so I thought I would start the stream a little bit early just to check the sound. So if you are listening and you can hear me okay, or if it needs to change, can you leave a comment for me? Um, and you should also check to make sure if you can turn it up on your end if it's not loud enough. Uh, because I'm using a microphone this time, so you ought to be able to get pretty good sound even if you turn it all the way up. I'll just hang out here and wait for some comments to come in. I hear loud and clear. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's helpful. Uh, I think I will play a little tune. I think I'll play Wild Mountain Time just so you can hear the harp. Make sure you can hear that. Okay. my mic just a tiny bit this direction. There we go. Uh, please, if you're still having any issues, let me know and I'll be monitoring the comments throughout. Uh, I do see it's seven o'clock, so I'm going to start talking about the concert. I'm really happy to see all of you. I recognize some of the names and I'm happy to share this concert program with you. I actually came up with the idea for this program about a month ago and chose all the music for it. And so I feel like the tone of all this music is a lot happier and more lighthearted than how I've been feeling these last few weeks. And I think how we as a community have been feeling these last few weeks. Um, so I hope that this can still be a enjoyable evening for you and that it can be peaceful and a moment of rest. Um, so the the idea for the concert came out of the coronavirus, of course. Uh, I was thinking about the summer and how everything that we usually do during the summer is changed and how very few people will be going on vacations and there won't be camps and festivals and fairs will be canceled. And so I thought maybe I will think about some of my past travels and just enjoy those again instead of going on new adventures. So uh, this is my way of bringing you along with me. And we're not going in any geographic order. We're kind of skipping around based on uh, what kind of music I thought would sound ne good next to um, the previous piece, etc. So we're going to start off in London. And I will be reading for you some excerpts from journals that I've kept 
or letters that I've written while I was on vacation. This isn't my actual journal, <laughs> but uh, here we go. So my friends and I went to London and we were staying in a bed and breakfast on the outskirts of London, close to the airport. And we got there around supper time. So the nice couple who owned the bed and breakfast said, you should take a walk down to the 16th century pub that is nearby and you should go through the churchyard because it's an experience. So we went through the churchyard as directed and I wrote, now normally I put no stock in the idea of a graveyard being a scary place. But as we left the friendly sidewalk lined with brick row houses to cut through the churchyard as instructed, I felt a supernatural sort of chill fill the air. Maybe I'd been reading too much Anne of Green Gables recently or maybe it was the purplish dusk, but the crumbling black headstones jutting out at odd angles from the mounds of uncut grass seemed unexpectedly menacing. Even the muted organ chords emanating from the church building added to the atmosphere. So my friends and I agreed that neither, none of us would have wanted to be walking alone through that churchyard that evening. We did end up going into the church right after that because it was open, and we had a lovely chat with the organist who was preparing for his Sunday morning service. And after that, we had a lovely supper at the 16th century pub. And it turns out that I'm actually quite tall, uh, as I've been told in my life. And in the 16th century, people were shorter, apparently, because the beams of this pub came to about here on me. And there were all sorts of signs. Duck, watch out for your head. <laughs> so. The music I've chosen to go with this experience is the Scottish ballad, The Selkie. And I'm interested to know if you are familiar with Selkies or not. And um, this is, it, it actually originates up in the Shetland Islands and there are seals up there. So the Selkie is a myth mythical creature in Scottish folklore that is a seal in the ocean and they can shed their seal skins and walk as humans on dry land. And this is a piece that I learned when I was a young girl, and it just always had sort of an otherworldly quality about it that I love. So I uh, hope you will enjoy. <laughs>
Somebody does know of the Selkies. Mike does cut out the reverb. Hmm. I think I'm going to change a setting if you will just pardon me in my audio. By the way, in honor of this program, I'm wearing my travel dress. This is the dress that I take on all of my uh, trips because you can stuff it into a luggage and it comes out mostly unwrinkled. Okay, I'm going to try that and we'll see if it's any better. Please comment one way or the other. <laughs> All right, <laughs> we are going to travel to the south of France now. So I lived actually in Montpellier, which is on the southern coast of France for two years. So a lot of these travels were based out of south, south of France. Uh, but I was coming back after a summer spent in America and we had a fall retreat. And so uh, my friend Jeanette and I took the train down to Set, which is a small town south of Montpellier along the coast. And then another friend of ours picked us up to take us to our guest house. So we're driving through the French countryside. And at one point, my friend po pointed out the window and we were right next to the sea and it was getting a little dark at that point. And I just saw this three masted ship. It was out at sea and it was lit from top to bottom. It looked like something out of the Pirates of the Caribbean uh, or out of Peter Pan, you know, when it's all covered in the fairy dust. And um, it was just magical. My friend, he said he thought it was probably going to Morocco. And suddenly I just had this need to go to Morocco. Uh, I haven't been there yet, but hopefully someday. So I'm interested to know if you have, if you experience, you know, somebody just mentions a place and suddenly you desperately want to go there. Um, so to represent this in music, I've chosen a Cantiga de Santa Maria. And this is a group of about 400 or so pieces that were written in the 13th century in what is now Spain. And these were pieces that pilgrims possibly would sing as they were going on their pilgrimage. And the reason this seems to fit for me is that there was a pilgrim route that went straight through the downtown of Montpellier. And it was marked with little shell, um, brass, uh, whatever they're called, in the road. And I would walk along that and think of those pilgrims. So this one is Cantiga 384. And it translates in English the name as the monk who wrote Mary's name in three colors. And the three colors were gold, blue, and rose.
go. Love that one. Good. I'm glad there was an improvement. All right. Next, we are not moving too far. We're just going to Spain. So I had the privilege of visiting Nirja, which is kind of, it's a resort town in the south of Spain, uh, two times for a week each time. I was on a, a retreat and had a lot of time to just walk along the beach and explore the town. And I made this list that I sent in a letter to my sister of all the things that I loved about Nirja. It uh, starts, wind whipped palm trees and deserted fire blackened brick ovens and goats in pens and rows of cabbages, and old British couples and little kids on bicycles, colorful laundry and Spanish music and clapping from behind plastic fences and clouds resting threateningly over the hills, orange trees and junky old cars like in America and the smell of the sea. There is an air of happy dilapidation about the place. So I really enjoyed my brief brief moment in Spain. So in honor of that, I have learned a Spanish dance. This was originally written for um, guitar, but then I've transcribed it here for the harp, and it is so fun. Here we go. Uh, the, the music that I bought for it just calls it Spanish dance. Uh, I'm curious to know if there's another name for it, so if you know it, please write it down for me. It's a traditional Scot or, um, Spanish tune. is a lot of fun. I was hoping to actually perform it for you on my lever harp, uh, but it turns out there are about 30 different lever changes and I thought it's safer to do it on the pedal harp. <laughs> Our next stop on this vicarious vacation will be in Sorrento. So Sorrento is a city in southern Italy 
and it's close to Pompeii. So my friends and I had taken the train down and we spent the day at Pompeii, which was great. But there is no shade whatsoever at Pompeii, except for that my friend Lisa had brought her umbrella and she very kindly lent it to me. Otherwise, I think I would have wilted um, and not loved it. But we got home to Sorrento. We were staying at an Airbnb. And the thing that I remember the most about the city is that it has all these courtyards and high walls and narrow streets, but there were vines kind of spilling out into the street and they were covered in blooming flowers. So I remember it smelled really nice. And it was just this um, kind of weird garden feel in the middle of a city. Anyway, uh, we went swimming that evening uh, down in this little, it was just maybe 20 feet of rocks, but there was a beach there that you could go swimming. And there was just something magical about being near this city, but swimming in the bay and we could see um, the mountain across the bay and it was lovely. So then that night we went home to our Airbnb and we didn't have a view of the bay, but if you stood on a chair on the balcony, you could see over the roof and <laughs> you could see all the lights at night kind of wrapping around the bay. And my friend Aaron, he got up there and he looked, he said, it looks like somebody draped a whole bunch of Christmas lights across the shore. So I just loved that image. For this uh, city, for Sorrento, I'm going to play a piece called Reverie and it is by Hasselman, who is a famous French harp composer. And there's just something buoyant about it that reminds me of swimming in Sorrento. going to take a minute here and read some of your comments. Thank you for the applause. <laughs> uh, good to see you all. Some of you, I don't know um, your names. You might be in disguise. Maybe I actually know you in person and I just don't recognize your name. <laughs> uh, all right. This next piece 
is inspired by a fortress in the north of France. So uh, it's called Mont Saint-Michel, and it is a peninsula, and sometimes it's an island, depending on the tide. But it sits all alone out near the sea, and um, it looks like Minas Tirith, or the castle at the beginning of Disney movies, uh, something like that. But I was able to visit with some friends, and I just fell in love with it. It's made out of stone, this gray stone, but it's all kind of turned green from kind of, uh, it's not quite moss. What is it? It's turned green. I liked it. Anyway, uh, what I wrote about it, there's a monastery that's right at the top. And I wrote of all the religious places I have seen thus far in Europe, this was my favorite. Sitting on the plain wooden bench in the main chapel, slightly chilled and refreshed by the stormy sea air, I felt as if I could have been a nun. Here there was just stone and wood and a space to worship God. So I'm actually gonna play for you a dance from Brittany. Uh, Mont Saint-Michel is in Normandy, which is in the north of France, but uh, Brittany is the region that is just to the west of it. And it's a Celtic, it's one of the Celtic nations. And so this type of dance is called an andro. And the dance itself, you all hold pinkies in a line, and the line kind of snakes back and forth throughout the room as you go, and then your arms move up and down in time with the music. And it's really fascinating to watch. I, I tried it once, and I didn't know what my arms were supposed to do, and so I ended up with really sore pinkies. People weren't being mean, you know, it's just like your arms don't know where to go. So this is an Andro from Brittany. Thank you guys. All right, so we're gonna go to Scotland next. Uh, I'm not actually going to talk about the Scottish landscape because if you've been to a concert of mine before, you've probably heard me say how much I love it. Um, I'm gonna share that we we're going to the castle Elendonan, which is, huh, 
it's in the Highlands. And um, we, <laughs> it was actually quite a frantic experience because I had bought the wrong tickets to get on the train. And they were for the following day. We only found this out about two minutes before our train was supposed to leave. And so finally the conductor uh, let us in and then we were kind of hustling onto the train and trying to see, okay, we need to buy new tickets now. How do we do that? Are we gonna be able to get a refund for the old ones? It was a little fran frantic. So uh, I thought it's not a true travel experience if you don't have some sort of a um, unpleasant experience, almost missing something. Back to the castle though, Elendonen. Uh, I was really looking forward to this castle. It is the most photographed castle in Scotland and it was a dream of mine to go there. The day that we actually got there was very sunny and so I was disappointed. I wanted it to be moody and misty and rainy, uh, but it turned out to be good anyway. The castle itself was rebuilt in like the 1920s and so it had kind of a Downton Abbey feel to it as opposed to the medieval sort of feel that I was expecting. Uh, but I really enjoyed one particular aspect of the architecture and I wrote in my journal later, everywhere scattered throughout were little lookout windows with tiny seats next to them that gave views of the loch and the mountains beyond. If I lived here, I would sit for hours and read or write or play harp because we all dream of living in a castle. So for this, I'm going to play for you Sky Air and this is off of my Celtic CD. Sky is the island that's just a little ways to the west of Elendonen. I don't think we could actually see it from there, but um, it has the same feeling of wide open spaces.
Thank you. <laughs> Have any of you been to the Isle of Skye, by the way? Or been to Elandonen? I recommend it. Next, we are going to travel to Capri, which is another island, but it's off the coast of Italy. And my friends um, had this plan. We were going to take the ferry to get to Capri, and then we were going to pay for another boat ride to go around the island. And I thought, we just took the ferry to get here. I'm not spending more money to get back on a boat. I'm going to go explore the island. But then it turns out all of my friends were going to go on the boat. So instead of feeling left out and sad, I decided to pay the 15 euros um, to go on this boat ride. Anyway, as we were discussing which boat we should take, a man came up to us. He said, my name is Luigi and I have a private boat. I will take you all for however many euros it was. And we thought about it and we said yes. And it turned out to be the best decision ever. It was this adorable little boat and it had yellow and white striped awning in the middle and it had white cushions all around. And he, he drove us around the island in his boat. Uh, and he would point to things, take picture, take picture. And I actually didn't have a camera on that trip. I decided to bring a journal instead, which is what you're experiencing now. Uh, but I wrote that I liked the view of the cliffs. Luigi said we might see goats. I immediately prayed that we would, and we did. But also, I liked staring out to sea and feeling the waves toss us about and spray us with salt. Laura and I spotted tiny purple jellyfish in one of the coves. And the water there was the color of a swimming pool. It was incredible. So I have a piece that has the same buoyant feel of being on a boat that I really love. It is actually, it's called Morceau à déchiffrer pour la harpe. It translates as uh, a sight reading assignment written for the Paris Conservatory in 1882. So it's kind of a silly little short thing, but it has this drama that I like about it. Just taking a moment to look at your comments. Oh, I'm glad some of you have been to Sky. Fantastic, thank you. All right, our next stop is another island. For living in Minnesota, I actually don't spend a lot of time around water in my native environment. And so when I travel, I get really excited about it. Uh, Santorini is an island off the coast of Greece. And uh, you may have seen it in calendars. That was where I first saw pictures of it. It has all the white buildings with the blue domed roofs. And uh, 
sunsets are a big thing in Santorini. They say that it's the most beautiful place to see a sunset ever. So my friends and I, we looked up where are you supposed to watch these sunsets and there's a ruined castle they say was perfect. So we got there early and we set up and we were gonna enjoy everything. And a few minutes before the sunset, there was this guitarist that came and set up and I was so excited. I thought this is gonna be amazing. We're gonna have traditional Greek music to enjoy this sunset and the mood was gonna be great. Uh, and then he started playing and he was playing American pop ballads from the 80s. And it was kind of a letdown because I'm not a huge fan of music from the 80s in general, but also it didn't seem to match in my mind at all what the soundtrack should be for that moment. So uh, this piece is closer to what I feel like it should have sounded. Um, I also wanted to just share that we did take the donkeys. Uh, you can go down to the shore and then take the donkeys up the steps to get back. And I do realize there is some controversy with this, um, which I was not aware of at the time. But I do feel like the donkeys that we rode were in very good health. And in fact, they were very enthusiastic. Um, I was kind of expecting it to be like riding a horse where you get on the horse and you have reins and you have some sense of control over where you're going to go. And I also thought that the men who owned the donkeys would be coming up the steps with us. But actually it was just, they got us all up on the donkeys and then they sort of said, go. And the donkeys ran and they had, uh, I don't know if they, it was like they were racing each other and it was kind of scary, uh, but fun. So there, there's a sense of excitement to that adventure that is in this piece, which is called Upla. And this was written by Kim Robertson, who is an amazing Celtic uh, harpist. And she gave me permission to play this today. So thank you for that. And this is kind of closer to the soundtrack I would have wanted for a sunset in Santorini.
excited to have been able to share that piece. I really love playing it. Mm. <laughs> yes, I need baklava now as well. Please send it through the webcam. All right, we're going back north. We are going to Ireland. And actually, we're, we're going to Northern Ireland. Uh, I got a chance to visit there because uh, I was living in France and the flights are so cheap inside of this little region of Europe and Great Britain. It was going to be like 35 euros to get to Northern Ireland from France. And we picked Northern Ireland because a friend of ours who worked at the local Irish pub in France um, recommended, he said there are fewer tourists and he was from Northern Ireland. So we asked him for a list of places to go and he gave us a list that included 13 pubs, which was more than we could hit in five days for our group, but it was very kind of him. Uh, we did make it to one amazing pub in County Antrim in Bushmills. And uh, I had checked and they had live music on Thursday evening. So we went and there was a harpist and two violin players and a baron player. And when I got to talking to them, the harpist so kindly let me actually play uh, two tunes with them. And she had her penny whistle ready. So she played with us and it was just a dream come true to play in Ireland, Northern Ireland. Uh, the pub itself looked exactly like I imagined it would. I wrote, it was beautiful. Hardwood floors, low beamed ceilings, and a roaring fire. The mantle decorated with copper kettles and the like. So I'd love to go back someday. I'm going to play an Irish jig for this one. This is called The Old Favorite, and it is from my Celtic CD. It's a little strange to play that particular tune in Irish jig on my big pedal harp, but I felt like the logistics of moving harps around and getting in the right place with the microphone would be just too, too challenging for me tonight. Oh, Sharon, I'm glad I'm making you smile. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Next stop, we're going back to Italy. <clears throat> Piazza Navona 
is a plaza in Rome that I had no interest in seeing whatsoever, but my friends were excited to see it, so we stopped by, and it turned out to be a lovely, lovely little interlude. Um, I'm interested to know if any of you have found places like that that you had no interest in seeing, and then it ended up being the most delightful thing ever. Um, if so, I want to hear about them. Um, but I just wrote that uh, it was beautiful to see Piazza Navona at sunset, filled with vendors selling scarves and artwork and light up squishy toys, which in my mind is associated with the 4th of July, but it really worked. It was, it was lovely. Uh, so I'm actually going to play an etude for you. This is uh, etude number two by Pizzoli, and I learned this on the sly, actually. I was practicing pedal harp and in the harp room, there were other students practicing in there. And this was open on the music stand one day when I walked in. So I sight, sight read it and instantly fell in love and did end up buying the book. So I'm reading off my own copy now. And for those of you who are familiar with it, I am adding some repeats. So if you get lost, that's why it's longer than it is supposed to be. This is the piece that convinced me to actually learn etudes. <laughs> uh, okay, we have a few more. This next piece is in Athens, in Greece. So um, we had gone to the Acropolis during the day and it was amazing, but we wanted to visit it at night also. So all the hills around the Acropolis are covered in olive trees and they're open to the public so you can wander. So we went back at night and there was this opera that was playing in the amphitheater. It was Don Giovanni. I looked at a program and uh, you could hear the music and the singing kind of just drifting over the hills. So we went up to Mars Hill and it was beautiful. You could see all the lights of the city. And you could also smell all the marijuana of the teenagers that were smoking up there. And so we thought we'd try to find some place that was uh, a little bit more deserted. So there was a hill over here that we climbed and eventually just sat down at the top of the hill. And we were kind of in this just little island of darkness surrounded by all the lights of the city. I wrote, we were in a dark island in a sea of golden lights. The Parthenon, one mountain over, 
glowed yellow against a black blue sky. The opera still continued and music from the restaurants on the opposite side clashed faintly around us. We sat and drank it in. So I thought I'd play for you some opera. This is part of the intermezzo from the Cavalleria uh, Rusticana by Mascagni. That I've played with orchestra before, but I just arranged this for solo harp for this occasion because I've been wanting an arrangement. So here we go. For you. Thank you so much for accompanying me this far on this kind of weird little popping up all over the place. And uh, if you did enjoy it, I would ask you to consider sharing it with somebody. There's also a link for tips if you'd like to um, donate to me via PayPal or Venmo. Uh, and I'm also actually on a new website called Buy Me a Coffee. So you can, I don't have the link for that, but you could look me up on that one. So this last piece is in Istanbul, as you probably expect from the title of the concert. And um, we ended our European vacation in Istanbul and we got to explore the Grand Bazaar, which was just fabulous. It was amazing. And I was walking with some, um, my friend Tim and Jen, and they wanted to buy a scarf. So we walked into a shop and my friend Tim asked, how much for this scarf? And the shop owner said, as much as I can get. And we all laughed. And then they bartered and came away with a scarf that they really loved. But the shop owner also said, would you be interested in buying a carpet, a rug? And Tim and Jen kind of looked at each other and shrugged and said, sure, we're interested. And then I wrote, 
Next thing we knew, we were following some Turkish man through the crowded paths of the bazaar, passing through arched corridors with glowing lamps and cafes filled with white-shirted men drinking coffee and smoking. And we proceeded to another shop where the owner greeted us and had us sit down and he started displaying these carpets. He had a, a assistant there who kind of held them and then let them roll out so that we could admire them. And my friend Tim again said, how much for the carpet? And the man said, oh, about $2,300. Tim said, oh no, I, this is not, we didn't plan on this. And the Turkish man was kind of hurt and he said, oh, you have to let your love of carpet grow in your heart, which I, I just loved that. And then he said, this isn't the carpet you're looking for. And so soon we found ourselves following another Turkish man through the paths of the Grand Bazaar and eventually out of the Grand Bazaar into smaller and smaller streets. And we we're kind of like, are we going to be able to find our way home after this? And we got to a third shop and the shop owner, Omar, greeted us. He had us sit down, he gave us tea and we talked about life and traveling and they bartered and eventually Tim and Jen bought a rug that they were very pleased with. And I was happy to have been along for the ride and not having to buy anything or worry about the bartering. So it's a fun, fun experience. This piece is called Katabim or Uskadar. And the melody is actually common to the region. It's a traditional melody, but the words that give it this Uskadar name were, um, as far as I can tell, popularized around the 1920s. So the words are more modern. Uh, but this is the first Turkish piece I've ever learned, so it's a pleasure to share it with you.
there you have it. We will end in Istanbul. And I thank you very much for joining me. And thank you for your kind comments. <laughs> and thank you for somebody um, getting the Star Wars reference. I love it. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, um, I think I will. I will. I will play one more piece which I thought this through ahead of time. And I wanted to share with you this piece because it connects to the way that I travel the most frequently, which is via my imagination by reading books. I love reading and um, I've been all over the place to places that don't exist in books. So this piece is called Mosswood and Thicket and the subtitle is That Feeling You Get When You Think About the Lord of the Rings. And I know some of you have probably heard it before because I, I love it. Uh, but I wrote this in high school when I was thinking about going off on adventures in my imagination. So I hope you enjoy. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a great evening.